Okay, well, hello everyone. My name is Paulette Lee and I'm the event producer for Microsoft and I'd like to welcome all of you to the Microsoft in Avanade and Accenture webinar on Zero Trust Architecture. We're broadcasting this through Microsoft Teams webinar and it is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. Please feel free to post questions in the chat window throughout the webinar. Our experts are standing by to answer them. And at the end of the webinar, you will have an opportunity to come off mute and we'll instruct you on how to do that at the end and ask questions by voice. Uh, the recording of this webinar, as well as the deck, will be shared with you within seven to 14 days after, after the event. And if you have not registered for the event, please do so. The registration link will be in the chat window um, so that you can receive the recordings. And thank you in advance for adhering to the Microsoft Code of Conduct today during the webinar. And with that, I will turn it over to Miriam to get us started. Miriam. Thank you, Paulette. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. Happy Women History Month to all of you ladies and gentlemen um, less, uh, participating. My name is Miriam Romani and I'm a Senior Business Strategy Manager with Microsoft Security Solutions area. As cyber threats grow more sophisticated and relentless, the need for implementing zero trust architecture is becoming more urgent. This is imperative to ensure safety and resiliency for critical infrastructures and our way of life. Especially now, with threats stemming from heightened geopolitical related events, it is a matter of urgent priority to ensure that your IoT devices and operational technology equipment and infrastructure, anything from oil pipelines to medical devices, are safe and secure. Our panel of experts from Microsoft, Accenture, and Avanade are going to provide you with guidance on securing your supply chain and IoT and OT assets. Let us let the panel introduce themselves. Let us start with you, Richard, please. Hey, thank you, Mary Ann, and hello, everybody. I'm Richard Diver. I'm the Senior Technical Business Development Manager at Microsoft, and I specialize in Defender for IoT is one of the products of many, and I love working with my partners like Accenture and Avanade to develop businesses around these products. So I'm looking, really looking forward to today's conversation around uh, OT and IoT infrastructure. Great, Thank uh, you, Richard. Yeah, I'll go next. Uh, so I'm Paul Brownlee. I'm uh, Accenture's North American OT cybersecurity lead and uh, also run Accenture's global industrial security uh, business. And, uh, and then in addition, in addition to that, I'm the interface between our industry X practice and our security practice, which handles all things uh, digital manufacturing. So excited to be here today to have a conversation with our, with our partners. Hey, Mariam. Hey, everybody. Uh, happy, happy, uh, happy, uh, happy International uh, Women's Month uh, to everybody out there. Um, uh, I'm really looking forward to today. I'm Andy. Uh, I'm the Global Offering Lead for uh, Avanard and their Cyber Security Cloud uh, area. Uh, really looking forward to the, the, the talk today with Richard and, and Paul and uh, Uche. So, yeah, over to you, Uche. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, hello everyone. Um, happy International Women's Day. Um, my name is Uche Xion. I'm a solution um, architect, security solution, security solution architect at the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence um, at Avanade. Um, I focus on um, embedding IoT security um, across projects. And um, most of um, the projects I work on um, have depend of IoT at, at its core, at their core. And um, I'm really happy to be on this panel and um, look forward to the exciting hour three, 45 minutes, hour ahead. Welcome to the webinar, everyone. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, this is awesome. We are excited to have you share with us today how we can leverage technology and your decades long expertise to help enterprises manage risk. Paul, let us start with you. Can you please tell our audience how they can out innovate and out maneuver our adversaries, please? Sure, and and I guess I'll, I'll start with just a, a little plug for for Accenture in, in all of this. You know, obviously, yeah, I'm excited to be here together with our partners to talk about OT and IoT security. Given this is a, an extremely important topic, Mary, as you mentioned at the uh, at the top of this. Now, you know, Accenture is, has grown our OT security practice significantly over the last few years. We see it as core to our overall security business because it's a problem that is at the core of all of our 
clients and businesses. And uh, we've done that organically and inorganically through lots of acquisitions of uh, companies like Stimation and uh, McGlon and uh, Revolutionary Security. And, and then also you know, put significant investment into you know, unique offerings. Like we've got a, a recent one that we just launched around OT MXDR, which leverages our strong consulting practice, our history of, of MSS, and then also our recent acquisition of Semantic CSS to detect and respond to OT security incidents in our, our clients' environments. Now, leading up to the conversation today, we've also leveraged some investments in what we call our OT Cyber Fusion Center, uh, which is a space that really focuses on the innovation you're talking about. It's a space we've built in our Houston office to um, you know, sort of fully simulate a you know, what, what an operating uh, control system for our clients is uh, end to end, and it's a it's a safe space for testing the the types of OT security controls and capabilities that we see out in the industry. So uh, creates a risk free environment for our clients to do that together with us. And uh, you know, obviously important to this conversation is our ecosystem of technology partners, and we're excited to be here to uh, participate with. Uh, Microsoft and our, our joint venture Avanade to discuss zero trust and uh, and all the, the trends that we see there. So uh, and then if maybe one one additional plug. You know, anytime we're excited. Anytime we can get this community together and while on the topic, we'll uh, just want to talk about the upcoming March 23rd OT Cybersecurity Summit that we have uh, coming. It's a Accenture hosted event. We've got Bob Dudley as our uh, former CEO and, and B, uh, of BP, who is uh, doing the opening keynote. And then we've got a closing keynote from Paul Shar, author of uh, Army of None, Autonomous Weapons and the Future of War. We'll have lots of conversations in addition to that from across industry and geography specific to OT cybersecurity. So uh, I'll drop a link in the chat for anyone who might be interested in signing up for that, but uh, another opportunity to get this, this uh, group together. So. With that, I'll hand it over to Andy and sort of set the scene for today and all the conversation that we can have uh, about uh, OT and IoT and Zero Trust. Nice one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Paul. So conventional uh, IT security thinking these days is mostly mature. And uh, you, only, you only usually find that it extends from cloud through to connected IT devices, whether they're mobile or fixed. However, this model doesn't stand up really well for OT devices. It's largely they haven't been managed in the same way. Uh, as IT assets and currently uh, they're falsely assumed to just be another endpoint to be managed. Now, OT equipment often sits, as you probably all know, on air gap systems that isn't generally software defined. Therefore, it didn't always need to enforce the stringent security and access controls as traditional IT did. But the progression to Industry 4.0 and beyond means these worlds are colliding faster than ever. Can you get to the next one, please, Uj? So, uh, I mean, if you look at the cyber attack kill chain, uh, unpatched devices or hardware, the threat of ransomware, malware, DDoS attacks, and, and, and all the other atrocities we see uh, are on the rise. And particularly as you go through the different stages of the cyber attack kill chain, um, and you know, coupled that with you know, what Mario mentioned at the, at the beginning of the talk about the strange geopolitical things going on at the moment. I don't really want to kind of focus on that, but, but you, you, know, we, you know, the needs to secure this stuff is getting more and more and more critical uh, as we go on. Um, so Uche, can I ask you, you, you know, how do we get these security models to cover OT and how I like to call it, the everything of things? Well, thanks Andy, um, that's a, a great question. Thanks a lot. Well, as you can imagine, um, extending security models to cover the OT domain and its operational requirements does have its challenges, right? So let's take a look at these in more detail. Um, the convergence of OT and IT has now become well-established. It's a well-established trend. And those who haven't um, actually implemented it are actually well on the way to doing this. And this is generally driven by uh, business benefits that hinge on things like real-time information sharing, analysis of data, response to the data, etc. Okay, so um, this network convergence, however, poses several risks. Let's take a look I suppose, at these. Risks. I suppose there's tons of data, tons of endpoints, lots of things going on. Exactly, exactly. So, the risks. Um, for one, these OT systems have grown historically. Um, and often lacked uh, basic security features and standards, such as those that have been kind of incorporated into today's enterprise IT environments through various industry standards like ISO 27001, NIST, um, you know, you name it. Um, and coupled with that, um, this equipment was never really um, built to be software defined, and therefore has traditionally had very little to no uh, need for stringent security and access control enforcement. And um, perhaps the most uh, pungent reason is that um, networks were generated, or these OT networks were generally designed to operate in an air gapped environment, so yeah. in, in fully air gapped modes, right? Um, which means they, they kind of generally relied on um, isolation and obscurity 
um, for the most part as their sole security strategy. So um, in today's um, environment, that's totally impractical, right? So based on these risks, right, um, we see that um, controls to OT environments should in actual fact require much, much, much stricter security protocols. You know, these this breaches can easily cause massive industrial, medical, environmental, and you name it, failures, okay? Um, in worst case scenarios, we've even, we've even had um, physical harm to humans, or in the most extreme cases, even loss, loss of life, okay? Well, so that underlines how important it is to, you know, to s strengthen these controls. You know, these days we are, um, you know, increasingly witnessing, or increasingly witnessing um, attackers exploit these vulnerabilities. Um, and this goes in both directions, so from the IT enterprise environment to the OT environments and vice versa. Um, so there's a lot of lateral movement between these, um, and these generally have very disastrous outcomes. Okay, um, So this has re generally resulted in um, regulatory and policy changes on government level, um, and um, an increased guidance from government-led sources to improve this state of nation and, the pro and, and, and to protect it from threats. Okay, so we see, for example, recommendations by bodies such as CISA, um, spe specialized recommendations regarding state-sponsored cyber cyber threats, um, as well as um, the Department of Homeland Security bringing out requirements um, like the famed Security Directive 2 by the Biden administration, um, which is generally designed to, um, to protect critical national infrastructure or CNI, and various other regulatory frameworks like like the Zero Trust, um, the White House Zero Trust Strategy, which kind of mandates that Zero Trust, um, 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 zero, the Zero Trust framework is implemented in all government um, offices and government buildings or government infrastructure. Okay, um, so if you're interested in all these policy directives or information on this, um, and like some links, um, feel free to pick them up afterwards. Or in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to share them with the presentation when we when we put the presentation up for for sharing afterwards, okay? Uh, nice, nice one, thanks Uche, I was gonna ask you that, cheers. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, knowing which assets you have and where they are is very, very essential to building a strategy based on zero trust, okay? And that's where we, so we being Microsoft, Avanade and Accenture, or as we like to call it, the power of three, um, can enable your business to secure the, as we like to call it, everything of things. Actually, Andy, that phrase came from you, if I'm not uh, mistaken, right? <laughs> <laughs> the everything of things. The everything of things, yeah. So, yeah, Andy, so with these guidelines and regulations, how does, the, how does this all map to the zero trust principles in our new world? Well, Uche, um, another great question, right? And again, I don't want to go into the current events going on. It's all world's gone a bit mad, but, but I mean, as we see the shifts in the working patterns, you know, um, um, again, things I don't like talking about, um, the <laughs> word, um, but increases in working from home, right? Uh, the increase of connected devices um, and all these different things and all these different elements have seen an explosion of new clouds and applications being spun up everywhere. And, you know, as you, as you rightly mentioned a minute ago, these operational technologies play an integral part in our lives <clears throat> and often operate in the shadows, right? So they need to be extremely reliable, highly available, heavily protected. And these shifts to cloud properly uh, for the operational technologies means that sometimes security doesn't stand up. Now, the recent attack trends um, show us that the operational uh, environments are quickly inheriting IT and IoT based services. So for instance, you've got cheap IoT devices being used to monitor and protect the sustainability programs in water treatment plants, human interface devices or human, human machine interfaces not being patched and longer term technologies to protect our future being implemented with little or no security. So, so all of these things add up and all of these devices that can be easily compromised means that the threat landscape is just growing. So, so where you've got OT alongside IoT and IT, it also makes it extremely hard to update and have visibility into all the different technologies that, uh, that go throughout their uh, life cycle, especially at scale with all the different vendors, uh, integrations and support, uh, and some OT environments have been around since the 70s. Right now, if we look at the Purdue model, um, uh, I don't know how much everybody knows about the Purdue model, but essentially you can see here, we separate it into the five levels. Um, the risk of the dangers are, are clear and present, you, you, you know, uh, attacker comes in via the, the enterprise network, uh, gets through to the, to the DMZ of the, uh, of the uh, industrial control system, and then below uh, this line that you can see on the right between generally the managed and typically unmanaged devices, 
um, um, from an IT perspective, um, uh, is where you can see the attack, uh, the, the attack uh, carry out. So, so again, you know, the convergence of OT and IoT to help wa uh, monitor water treatment plants, power stations, oil, gas plants, pipelines, hospitals, agriculture, industrial, you know, the list goes on and on and on, right? And, you know, what if it ultimately compromises food chains, right? It ultimately causes problems and security weaknesses, as you mentioned, right? It might cause injury or loss of life. But, you know, I, I, as I said before, I would argue there's a, a moral and a sustainable urgency for us to secure and embrace the everything of things. Um, so Uche, you, you know, we've got all these different devices. Would you think that some of them are considered a higher priority than others? Yeah, thanks, Annie. Thanks for that question. Very relevant question. Um, so I'd say one thing that empowers these decisions is the data or as everybody calls it nowadays or as we, as we, as we call it, the new oil. Um, and the benefits of it, um, benefits it provides businesses and the outcomes. However, for OT environments, the risks, uh, the dangers, the potential for harm or loss of life means that they generally pose um, a higher threat because there's simply, um, there's simply more at stake, right? So, so basically you're saying we need to take the security of all these environments seriously and especially through their convergence, right? Absolutely, absolutely, Andy. Um, and the way we're continuing collecting, continuing uh, continually connect, collecting the sorry, continually con collecting the data, learning from the data, adapting from it, um, and adjusting to the technology shifts, um, makes it even harder to make sense of all all, all of it, all the data, right? Um, and that's where, again, the power of three, Microsoft, Accenture, and Avanard, um, have you covered? Uh, in fact, adapting a zero trust mindset has never been um, this important. So. Andy, back to you. What does um, the term zero trust mean to you, if I may ask? Oh, thanks, Uche. Do you want to pop on to the next slide? So, I mean, technically speaking, zero trust isn't a thing, right? Let's get that clear, <laughs> right? It's not something you can hold, touch, sniff or smell. Um, um, it's rather a model for, compromising uh, for, for comprising strategies and approaches that assumes a network security is always at risk because essentially every node or device or Thing is at risk, right? So this could be, for example, like I said before, IT, IoT, or OT devices installed all over the corporate network, or OT devices in the management infrastructure that oversees the, the the health and availability of said critical national infrastructure. Right now, again, can't emphasize enough: zero trust has become especially re relevant with the new realities surrounding remote work habits, the pandemic, the the other thing that we're not wanting to talk about at the minute as well, but but you, you know the, the management and infrastructure that oversees the health of all of this stuff is you know is, is growing. Uh, more frequent and riskier connections from outside the corporate perimeter, insider and outsider threats, and and I mean insider threats because sometimes they make accidents as well. You know, so you want to make sure that that things are being uh, you, you know dealt with properly uh, and. and you know, as I said, you know, some of the more nation state things that we've seen in the news rate lately. So, so, you know, the traditional model always assumed that all activities within, well, I say the traditional model, um, was assumed that, that, that all devices in the network perimeter were safe. I mean, this was and is untrue. And, and speaking to a CISO of a, of a hospital recently, they said that, you know, once you already have a vendor or a system within your, your system, the consideration for trust is already gone, right? So, right. yeah, Uche. Right, yeah, um, absolutely. I'm, I'm on board with you, with, with that thought. Um, and, and for me, I think zero trust just signifies um, a shift from the traditional perimeter-based network paradigm, which, which everybody has grown to, to, to understand over the past few decades and trust fully, uh, to a security model that completely extends beyond um, um, on-premise networks. Um, and um, with zero trust, we just simply assume that the network has been compromised. And like compromised period, okay? Um, whether there's suspicion for this or not, or there's a, a reason for suspicion or not. And um, zero trust challenges every single user or device within the perimeter to prove that they are not attackers, okay? So zero trust requires a strict identity, verif identity verif verification for every user and device when attempting to um, access resources on network, um, even if this user or device is already within the network perimeter. So even though you've been ad admitted to the perimeter, um, it should be assumed that you are there to breach it, okay? So it assumes breach, so Zero Trust assumes breach, and as a result, explicitly verifies all activities and does this by employing the principle of least privileged access. So as the name implies, the motto is trust no one, okay? 
So um, Andy, um, how can we even begin to move to the cloud and make use of zero trust architectures, uh, architecture when all these converging technologies are making migrating to the cloud even more difficult? Cool, thanks, uh, um, man. And yeah, I mean, that's where today's demo comes in, right? So uh, for now, I'll just hand over to Richard whilst we get that set up and hopefully the demo gods will be good to us today, right? Yeah, go work on that. Thank you, guys. Um, great questions coming in on the chat window. I've been replying back to those uh, frantically and we'll try to cover them more in our open Q&A session afterwards as well. So in this demo, what you're going to see is uh, we're going to focus really in this industrial space. But one of the great benefits from the Microsoft approach is that we can cover both the OT and the IT side. Um, in the OT side, you wanna deploy these sensors strategically across your networks. Another great idea is to do this on the cloud. If you can do this on the cloud, it means we can go global, you know, within hours, days, weeks, months, you can get this deployed very quickly. If you can't and you're on-prem only, we can manage any other SIM. You don't have to send it to cloud. There are flexibilities in deployments. So what you're gonna see in this demo, if it all works well, uh, is gonna be things like how we actually map the devices. So this is being done by deep packet inspection on the unencrypted OT networks. You're gonna see the devices, you're gonna see this nice inventory. We're gonna see which devices are talking to which other devices. And this is the kind of visibility that a lot of customers, they don't have today. They don't maybe even know how many devices they have, let alone which ones are talking on what protocols. And then let's mark which ones are critical uh, and if we need to, let's create alerts generated by these sensors. So these alerts can be sent out locally to local teams. Let's say a ship in the middle of nowhere, the team on the ship need to know about it. But if it is connected, it has network connectivity, maybe somebody else is monitoring a hundred ships at the same time. I use ships as a good analogy because that really is a disconnected network sometimes. Um, other networks say they're disconnected, but what we find is you have a firewall it's mostly disconnected, but you can allow some communication through. So if you can do monitoring remotely, we can enable this um, too. And then we'll also see how, if you do connect this into your SIM, we're gonna use Sentinel in this example. What does that look like? And now what can we do with the response from that? And we're really tackling that problem of, can IT help OT? Maybe not today in your world, but if we can, we want them to share knowledge with each other. If the attack is coming across the VPN or RDP or SSH, and it's getting across those firewalls from the IT side or from the internet, and it's getting into that OT world, we have to tell the right people to go close the right places and fix that problem the right way. So over to you, looking forward to seeing the demo. Cheers, and I'll keep you. answering any questions as they come in. <laughs> Thanks, Richard, I appreciate it. Thanks very much for that intro. Um, so for those of you that don't know this, this is the um, Defender for IoT um, dashboard. Um, and um, so, this, this dashboard um, is, is something we set up using the, um, the in, a, in our lab environment, using the, the ICS um, enterprise network, uh, based on the ICS uh, Geek Lounge on, um, demos and, and pickups. Um, and um, this is um, basically a, a view of the, of the, of the system. The, of the state of the system, um, where we can kind of get to look at get to look at uh, the main features that are important to any health related issues with regards to Defender for IoT um, and and uh, with with regards to the OT network and, and its health. Okay, so to provide um, a greater context, we can actually take a look at um, the device map, and um, I'll I'll hand over to Andy to kind of give us um, a little intro into what this is. Thanks, UJ. And, and it's probably also worth kind of mentioning as well. So uh, the other part of this that we built as well, um, unfortunately, one of our other labs kind of is bound for maintenance at the moment. But what we also did is we um, built an IoT network as well and overlaid that over the top. So as we go through this, you can see the different elements of the Purdue model here um, on the presentation. But uh, it, it effectively, uh, it gives you uh, the ability to be able to see uh, machines that are supposedly on an air gas system, you know, kind of to Richard's point a minute ago, um, but then actually you, you can actually see the, the paths of them that, uh, you, you know, there might be a certain, you know, uh, a server in a, a certain domain that is allowed to talk to uh, a certain something. So you can quite quickly get to see the, 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 the chain of attack and, and the way in which a lot of these devices can talk to each other. But as you can see here, um, you know, we can start to profile these as well, particularly as we've had uh, a, a lot of these unattended alerts come in. 
uh, earlier, as you've seen on the dashboard. Uh, if we right click one of these, uh, Uche, you can kind of go and have a look at the properties. You can run the activity reports against it and all the usual things that you might be able to say. Uh, I mean, this was kind of run this morning and we're still learning from the data that uh, we put on there. But if we come out of there, Uche, and um, you can see here it's a, a Mitsubishi controller uh, of some some sorts. So, and again, it's talking to the process control layers in the in the Purdue model. Um, which again, as you kind of come up and down and look at the look at the things, you can see that's talking to something actually in the enterprise network. Can you click on that one in the enterprise network there? Cool, and you can see that's going to the internet. So th there are routes here and there are routes out, and you know this is kind of designed on a on what would potentially be a, a, an air gap system uh, with with, with uh, corporate devices. Um, so from there, um, I think we could probably go into the inventory, right, Uche? Yes, correct. Um, yeah. So the device inventory is like um, more or less um, a different view um, of the data collected um, shown earlier on the device map. So basically the network sensor gathers the data or collects the data and it's now displayed in, in, in the form of an invent in a device, um, device inventory in the form of a table. And um, you have this all sorted in columns um, which can, um, can be filtered, right? They can be filtered, they can be, um, you know, um, sorry, just give me a second. Uh, oops. Okay, so we can we can filter, we can view this from different angles, and we can also um, click on the in individual um, um, devices to give us um, device property information. Okay, we have the op option here, which by the way had also within the um, within the device map to um, authorize um, authorize or deauthorize a device. So um, from this interface, we can literally um, mark a, 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 a device as authorized or not. So to be able to to continue communicating on the network or kind of shut it out. We also have the possibility of exporting um, to CSV file to have all this data within, um, you know, an Excel sheet or, you know, a spreadsheet to kind of analyze this more or to kind of export it further to a different system. I, I suppose to Richard's kind of point, isn't it? Um, you know, knowing what you've got in your network is essential to, 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 to doing this stuff. Um, Richard, can you remind me, did you mm. mention about playing back PCAPs and things like that when you were doing the synopsis as well? Yeah, so one of the ways that we can ingest this data, um, normally we do it for lab environments or initial setup for our customers to capture a PCAP file off their network, ingest that into the sensor, and then we can actually run risk assessments for you. So we don't have to touch the network at all to be able to do that. Once the sensor is actually deployed, it's monitoring 24 seven, and then we're listening to a, uh, basically a wiretap or spam port and we're uh, taking live data coming in. Yep. Yeah. yeah, thanks, thanks. And you know, just to kind of add into that as well for a, for a bit of a, a heads up, um, you know, if there are any clients or, or, or people listening in today, we're, you know, for the first five people registering, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're willing to do five free assessments. So if you do want us to, uh, get this spun up for you and help you identify what's on your network and and uh, you, you know get get the power of uh, Avenard and Accenture and Microsoft. Then please do feel free to reach out. Um, Uche, is there anything else that we want to look at in here? Is it have is it worth having a look at some of the alerts that have uh, popped up? Yeah, let's let's take a let's, let's take a look into into the alerts section. So um, here we have different types of alerts um, which we can actually um, which are categorized um, into security alerts or operational alerts. Here we have a tab to kind of separate them as well. Um, here again, we can go into the alerts and um, kind of get remediation steps. First of all, get information on what's happened, like what, what port was scanned or what device was scanned, what's happening, the remediation steps possible. Um, and if, for example, this um, alert, which the system picked up or system deems as an alert, is in actual fact not an alert, we could kind of um, say, okay, you know what, system, learn. Accept this as a non-alert, and the system kind of categorizes this as a non-alert, and then it, it gets taken off the list, okay? Um, we have the possibility of acknowledging this and saying, okay, you know what, taken, note taken, I've, I've, I've understood this, I've seen it, what this is it, about. It could and be a false, it could be a false positive, right? Could, Sometimes they've got scanners positive. on the network and effectively we are scanning the network, right? Exactly right. Correct. Um, yeah. So um, so I can I can actually go in and um, download PCAPs. 
So we spoke of pickups earlier on, which you can actually reload into the system, into this system or our system. So whatever um, has been done here or detected here can kind of be replicated on a different system. So with these links here or these buttons here, we can download um, a related filtered pickup, which can then be um, like exported and re-imported into a different system. Um, we have the option of downloading a full report, right? So basically these remediation steps and some other details, which will then be um, downloaded as a, as a PDF file to be shared or to be presented, for example, to, I don't know, um, stakeholders when we're, we're having a um, um, risk assessment review or something like that. The risk scenario for that is um, incident response. So sometimes when we deploy the, the sensors, we actually detect that a customer is already compromised. It's an unfortunate thing to find out. And then we can bring in the incident response team and start to clear out any kind of malware, et cetera, before it has actually has an impact. It might have been sitting there for months or years, before, just not doing anything until the, it gets its internet connection and then becomes live. This, having the ability to download that PCAP and also to be able to capture this data and keep it for months or years is another problem that we have in the OT world, is if you want to go back and see something that was happening six months or a year ago, don't have the data, you can't do that. So we want to be able to capture this data 24 seven, store it securely and make it available to those incident response teams to say, when did this start to happen? Because then you can start to see what else could that attacker have done if they've been in my environment for nine months or a year or more. So very I handy. suppose that helps with identifying attestation and things like that, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. You don't know what you don't know and we don't know tomorrow what all the problems were yesterday. So we'll find out something tomorrow that we needed to go back and look at. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, nice one. Cheers. Yeah. So, um, thanks, thanks, Richard. I appreciate that. Um, so, so if you have the, you know, we have the option of, of setting up an online sensor and an offline sensor, and with the online sensor, we also have the additional option of um, sending alerts via the cloud um, to a cloud native SIEM, such as Sentinel. Of course, um, you can use other SIEM systems of choice, such as Splunk or Curator, um, but um, we obviously um, favor um, using Sentinel because of the native integration and the seamless um, interoperability between the two systems. Okay, so um, then we, when we go to we can, we can take a look at Sentinel, we can take a look at Sentinel and see how these alerts, which by the way, um, 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 get transferred to Sentinel as incidents. Um, we can take a look at the Sentinel system and have a look at how these are actually captured and presented. So after having um, integrated um, the two systems, which we do via an IoT hub, which links both of them, um, we um, have the, the incidents or the alerts which come over as incidents um, listed here. And we can um, literally um, go in and have a more detailed look. Okay, so here we have all the details which you also had in the Defender for IoT, the web interface, and um, have all the access and information or uh, the, the, the data um, surrounding this incident um, summarized on a page. Yeah, so and, Richard, isn't this kind of where you were talking about how this is the, the this is kind of also where the power comes from, right? Yeah, this is my other favorite topic is Sentinel, but again, any sim you like. Uh, within Sentinel, what we're doing here is we're taking the data from those sensors. And again, this could be one way, read only, send out only if people are worried about data coming back down to on-premises. But with this data being inside of the sim, we can now see attributes like all the entities that are involved. If there was a user ID that we captured or IP addresses and devices, Perhaps it was a uh, remote support worker traveling around in the van, visiting site to site to site, and they have to remotely dial in, connect to some system at the back end, modify a change, and then carry on to the next site. We're going to see that happen, and we're going to see it on the IT side as they came in through the VPN, they did their authentication, then as they get into the OT systems, we're now going to capture it on the OT systems and see the Modbus command they actually sent to a PLC to make the change. And if that was good, great. If it wasn't good, we want people to be able to see that, and they can make that decision. And they can go through and say, yeah, should a, should a Modbus command to change appeal, should that have been done at two o'clock in the afternoon? Or should that have been done through change control and maybe want to roll that change back if it was actually an attacker that did that instead? Yeah, that could be an insider threat, as I mentioned before as well, right? Yeah. Making an accident, you know, they could genuinely be updating something and not following proper process. Exactly. It could be an operational issue, not just a security issue. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 uh, it's probably worth uh, talking about uh, a little bit about the playbooks and the um, and the workflows that we can do on top of that as well, right? 
Oh yes, yeah. So absolutely, this interface allows us to um, kind of tri triage um, triage this um, incidents. And um, if we wanted, we could actually uh, go in and, and you know, receive full details um, and investigate this further. Um, for example, by clicking this button, um, which takes us to a graph view where we have um, a more differentiated overview of what's actually happening. And within this graph view, um, we can, for example, look at related alerts. So this all brings it nicely together um, into a single pane of glass, um, in a single pane of glass um, 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 overview and uh, kind of puts it all nicely together. Yeah, and I suppose that gives the, the, the better story as to who we need to, to, to contact to close the holes as well, right? Right, not every IT kind of cybersecurity expert is going to understand Modbus protocols or, or uh, any other kind of, um, of these unique protocols, but what they can do is at least understand, is any of this an attack that I know about? And if not, I'll forward this on to the other team. And so this is where we get to the OT and the IT side. This doesn't have to be only IT security teams looking at it. This information is all packaged up and ready so that by the time you get it to the OT teams, they don't have to go and carry out secondary investigations and look through logs and go into the details, which may be captured in their SCADA systems or not. We try to put as much information in here as we can so they're more informed before they then take their next steps. Again, and again, we're not making any changes. We're not going back and patching. We're not going to go and reboot. We're not going to go and kill some things. We're not killing the environment as we do this. We're really just watching, listening, learning, and then advising and telling people what we see. Uh, and that kind of plays into reducing technical debt as well, right? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, that's going to be the next level of conversation across um, many systems is what do you do next to improve the defenses and reduce the risk? Again, if you have an visibility of what does my network even look like, where are my protocols? I still see a uh, token ring being used. And like, oh, how are we going to get this token ring upgraded? <laughs> Maybe we just switch straight to you know, IPv, uh, IPv based encryption and we start to modify it completely, but not every system out there can handle Encrypted networks, let alone um, anything other than token rings. Yeah, so, so op operational. Op I was going to say operational technical um, availability debt as well. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. these systems go down. It's a big thing, right? Exactly. In many, uh, if you take an industrial environment like a factory, many of them will have uh, failover redundancy, uh, multiple paths. You can actually detect with this that you don't have a multiple path. <clears throat> and if somebody was to put a digger through the footpath outside the building you've probably lost your factory, whereas you're expecting to have multi-pathways. So there's a lot more insights can come out of this, but the most important one is, is there malware? Are there operations being carried out that shouldn't be? And then after that, yeah, a whole bunch of other um, investigation can be done about the re um, reliability of your network infrastructure. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I mean, just a quick uh, story whilst we pivot over to the quick Q&A. Um, a few years ago when we used to do the thing called building data centers, I was over in uh, the Netherlands over Christmas time and, and we were doing a network upgrade. The reason that we had to do the network upgrade over Christmas was because it was the only time the plant could be down. It was the only time that they could have, and we had a two week window. Otherwise, if we didn't get the OT environment up, um, they would have had to have gone through a whole bunch of FDA Federation um, regulation, re um, you know, re-establishing all their um, uh, all their certification, uh, which is something like two million dollars an hour or two million dollars like like every couple of hours or something that they were going to lose. You know, this can this can like bankrupt businesses, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Um, just cool. um, one, one quick thing. Um, so what we examined so far have been kind of like reactive detection um, and, um, and response capabilities and um, before we move on to over to the q and I'd like to kind of like just highlight that we also have um, the means to kind of proactively monitor this, um, monitor these um, these these um, areas. And um, for this, we have within um, the Defend of IoT risk assessment uh, functionality. And um, uh, Andy or Richard, I don't know if you'd mind like kind of giving us a short overview of what this is and what this can do, very briefly. Yeah, I can, I can take that one if you like, Andy. So when we run this risk report, what we're doing is looking at the last 30 days worth of data. And we can, inside of this report, you'll see that, and we can run this for you very quickly, which is the nice thing about it, straight away see not only um, what have we seen happen and occur in the last 30 days from those alerts that you saw, but actually based on the configuration of things like, uh, the, we, can, we can do WMI queries and we can look at firewall uh, port configurations and we can say, based on the configuration of your network, 
here's the most likely vulnerable devices and also the attack path that we would follow. So we're kind of in a virtual attack against the network, just using the data that we see, and then we report that in this report and hand that back to you to say, this is what we have. So if you deploy this out to all of your networks, the next thing for the security team is to go around each one of those segments or each one of those business units and run one of these reports on a monthly basis and say, where are we at with our patching schedules? Why do I still have these things out of date? And although you might not be able to get them patched in the next day, week or month, you have a plan to start tackling this risk score and do this risk assessment. And you can see we can cover all types of different technologies, understand what patch level they're at and work with those companies to say, can I upgrade this software? Can I apply that CVE? Can we resolve this problem before it becomes a risk to my business? Okay. And if you scroll down a bit, you'll just see a little bit more down the bottom. Um, and you can, we'll just go through very quickly, but again, you, we get to run this against your environment just using a PCAP file. So if you send us a PCAP file, we'll run this risk assessment and tell you what we see straight away before you invest in deploying hardware and sensors and buying licenses and all the other good fun stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. This happens uh, zero touch, so uh, non-intrusively without affecting um, production. So zero production downtime, zero, zero touch, passive. That's the yeah. amazing beauty of this tool. Well, especially the time sensitive nature of some of these networks as well, right? Exactly. Cool. Okay, beautiful. So. Um, so I think just for the sake of time, this has been a brilliant uh, demo. Thank you very much, uh, Uche and Andy. Um, I think we should probably um, jump into the question and uh, questions uh, section of our um, webinar. And I sure hope that some folks are able to stay with us longer so that we can get to more questions. So I want to first um, thank again our esteemed panelists for sharing their brilliant insights and into implementing zero trust architecture in IoT OT infrastructure. And thank you for all the questions that you have been posting. Um, please keep them coming. And as uh, Paulette has instructed, if you, uh, we encourage you to um, answer live uh, questions by using the raise your hand feature. And then based on the priority of the questions coming in, we will unmute you. Having said that, prior to the webinar, we did get um, several uh, canned questions. I'm going to ask one of them just to give you guys time to uh, to do that, to raise your hand. And if one of the question is really, um, uh, it comes from, um, do you have a premise or environment where you can show us real life demos tailored to our environment? And I was wondering, uh, Paul, if you can um, please answer that question. Sure, and, and this is, uh, I mentioned this at the top of the, the conversation, we, we do have physical space in Houston where, where we both uh, physically and virtually uh, have worked through a variety of clients across industry for you know, real operating control systems. We've got all the tools and capabilities that we typically see in the industry. We can run through a variety of use cases and show from the beginning to the end, what, what would the operator see in this case? Uh, what would your SOC be able to see? And then how would you orchestrate a response to something like that? So uh, yes, short answer is yes, we have physical spaces where we can bring in clients and, and uh, you know, work through is, problems like that. Is, is, it, is it just Houston that you've got, Paul? So we've got Houston. We also have a variety of other locations where you know, we have S in Germany. We have uh, one up in DC. We have uh, some locations around, around the world where we're, we're uh, you know, our OT server or our server fusion centers for different topics. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to work with us in any of those locations or you've got any kind of reasons that data needs to stay in local areas, then please just reach out to us, right? Excellent. Thank you for that. And um, do we have any questions uh, from the audience uh, that want to ask those questions live, uh, Paulette? I don't see any. Yeah, this is one of those uh, uh, different webinars. Normally, you, people are used to coming to a webinar and you can't actually talk to us. But if you want to, you can raise your hand. You can come off mute and we'll actually have a chat with you. If not, we understand it's not your normal way of coming to a webinar. <laughs> so since, uh, you thank you, uh, Richard. I want to ask one more question. Um, and I know we may be already at the end of our webinar, but I want to ask it. Um, if Anyone's, uh, what anyone is interested to know more about the sizing and pricing, Richard, how can they go about it, especially after you dazzled us with that risk assessment report? 
Yeah, let me uh, just cover it very quickly because it's worth knowing, you know, before you get into what, how expensive it's going to be. We've made it extremely easy to use this for 30 days for free, which is one of the reasons why we can give these kind of free assessments and just really understand the power of the technology. So with a 30 day trial, you can have full access to, to run your own assessments, have the team come along and help you with those assessments. And then after that, it's a very simple structure that because it's a cloud based service, even if you're only using it on premises, we charge on a per device basis. So starting at say 100 devices, um, you pay a very small amount each month and then it grows as you start to deploy to more sites and there's no commitment. So you could roll this out, deploy it to a few sites, do some assessments. And if after a while you decided it wasn't working for you, you can turn it off again, which is what I love about the cloud is turn it on, turn it off. Ideally, you'll see this is a very powerful and useful tool. You'll deploy it fully to every network segment you have. And again, we can always talk about things like um, uh, discounts and pricing and structures. But the most important thing that we have to encourage is you go out and try this and get an assessment done on your network just to see if there are any current risks and what your network looks like. And then go from there and deciding what to do next. And Richard, that makes me think about the whole aspect of risk management. If I'm a manufacturer and I want to show to my um, insurance, cyber insurance partners that I'm doing um, the right things to reduce my uh, risk exposure, wouldn't that be something that they can utilize um, to show not only security risk uh, management, but also from an operation perspective? I recall that we saw that in the demo. Sure. If any company is under any kind of regulation or any of the um, impending uh, uh, CMMC, or we've got the defense industrial base, we've got a lot of different organizations and companies that are really becoming critical infrastructure now. They weren't before, but like, toilet paper and hand sanitizer is part of critical infrastructure, who knew? Um, they are all <laughs> going to need at some point to show that the equipment they have and what they're running is going to run well and is potentially going to stand up to some kind of cyber attack that may come in the future. You can't do that if you don't know what you have even on running on your network, let alone the, the protocols that are running and the type of uh, risks there might be. The one that always triggers me is when somebody says I'm in an air gapped, isolated environment. Let's test that. Let's find out if you truly are air gapped and isolated. And then we can prove you are because we'll have, we'll have we won't have detected any Internet connectivity on your network. But without monitoring and checking that and seeing that somebody every Sunday night at four o'clock in the afternoon connects it to the Internet and then disconnects it again. We want to find that one uh, outlier potentially and say, here's, here's where it's not how you think it is. And that's, that, that's what this technology allows us to do now. And, and maybe Andy, you can touch on um, how could uh, um, they tackle this air gap uh, system issue with regards to change of uh, controls and the strict processes that are in place. Well, I, I mean, it's, it's quite funny because back to kind of Richard's point a minute ago, you know, testing whether the, the, the system is air gapped. Uh, there was a recent, um, uh, I mean, this is kind of, it's still in the lab, but, but there was a, a recent um, demonstration that uh, where they were using LAN wires to connect the different devices in an industrial control system, they were using the wires within the actual LAN to, to communicate to uh, a, a person in the car park that was exfiltrating data from uh, from that network. So, so you know, it's a, it's a really kind of interesting place uh, in which we need to kind of detect yeah, and yeah. I'll respond. I'll give you another good example as well. Is um, many customers are reliant on partners to come in and help deploy different solutions. And what we've seen is some of them come in and implement their own Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. 3G, 4G, 5G type devices into the network in order to allow their equipment to communicate home. That's not really a, it's a back door, but it's not a, an official communications channel. It bypasses the firewalls, it bypasses the local network. So yeah. if one of the devices we detect on this network is actually an, another networking device that's sending that communications out through some other channels, again, you'd want to know about this. Um, there are some other ways of doing it, like walking around physically with an antenna and trying to detect radio signals and uh, GPS signals, etc. But new IoT, industrial IoT devices are being added to old industrial networks um, to modernize and update them. And we don't always know what impact that's going to have. Um, and so it's certainly worth doing that asset inventory and understanding when things change, what change uh, was made. Yeah. Thank you for that. There is a question um, from our uh, audience, uh, Bilal. Is there a white paper that talks about the detection use cases? Example, if someone is plugging in a USB into operator's workstation, Stocksnet, anyone? 
Yeah, right. Um, actually, that goes to a different layer of protection. So in the OT world, there are Windows and Linux devices. Um, I don't think we have Mac, iOS and Android yet, but they're there too. So that's when we start to decide to protect these networks. This is detection we're talking about today, but to actually protect those networks, you can deploy um, true EDR solutions like Defender for Endpoint onto those products. And then, yes, we would be able to detect, protect, and prevent uh, USBs, malware, all the other problems that we have. So again, if we see that a an, an operator is out in their van driving around, they have a laptop and they're dialing in to help in this OT network, you would want to make sure that laptop they're using is in a zero trust model and it's a, a highly privileged account and that they're protected through multi-factor authentication and they can only come from that device and no other device. And so there's a lot of other lockdowns and controls we can apply that have no impact on OT networks and the operational capability, but a much bigger impact on the operator that's trying to get remote access and make sure they're doing it in the most secure way. And this is where sometimes we find the IT OT sides are not necessarily following the same best practices. The enterprise and IT world are fighting the cybersecurity problems because they're connected to the internet 24 seven. The OT world is kind of shielded from that because they can only get in through trusted pathways. But if you can break that trusted pathway and come in as a trusted user, you've now got this huge risk that you weren't expecting as a risk in the past. And to be honest, that's the most of the ways that the attackers are getting in today from, the, um, from what we see and what's being reported and what we get to respond to. They are coming in through the IT pathways. So good question. Um, we have good answers. White papers, yeah, there's plenty on the Microsoft security websites about how to protect these devices. Yeah, we, we used to throw these uh, attached to power banks uh, onto the top of buildings and just, it's a, a poisonous <laughs> Wi-Fi pineapple for those that know. And speaking of uh, bash bunnies and uh, and uh, rubber duckies, Mariam, there you go. Pineapples, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yes. if you want our red team to come in or anybody's red team to come in and try it, they, I've heard stories on breaking legs to get into these places. They they will get in physically. So we'd certainly want to detect once they plug something in and modify and change something. Absolutely. Wow. So thank you. I think like all good things, this one has to come to an end. Please join me to thank our esteemed panelists. Really grateful to the insight you shared. And um, with that, I want to give it back to Paulette, please, to wrap us up. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Miriam, and all of the speakers. Great presentation and demos today. They worked. And so <laughs> it's great. We do value your feedback. Um, please help us improve future events like this. There's a link in the chat window for our survey and uh, be the first 10 to submit the survey and you'll receive a downloadable ebook from one of our esteemed speakers, Richard Diver. So be the first 10 to uh, submit a survey and we'll send you the link to download his new book. It is on Azure Sentinel, but um, it is a very fascinating book. And uh, we love Richard for doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad we can get some copies out for free. That's fantastic. Yes. And this does conclude today's webinar. I'll let the speakers say goodbye. And thank you all for joining. And we will get the recording and the deck out to everyone within the seven, well, about 7 to 14 days. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye you. Everyone. Stay, Bye -bye. Safe. Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.